What's up, everybody? Welcome to another episode of Game Dev Unchained, the number one game development podcast and the lifestyle thereof. I am your host, Brandon Pham. And joining me this week, a very special guest, Michael Brown. How you doing, Mike? Hello. How's it going? Great, man. Uh, thanks uh, for joining us. So, You're very welcome. <laughs> so this is part of the podcast where... Uh, our guests, such as yourself, uh, introduce yourself to our listeners and audience out there of who you are, where you come from, and where you're heading. Sure. So um, I'm Michael. I'm the CEO of Vicarious PR and Vicarious Publishing. Um, Vicarious PR is a video game PR agency, and Vicarious Publishing is a newly formed publishing label specifically targeting um, indie games and kind of mid-tier games um, on PC and console. Do you mind kind of going a bit into your past? How did you get into PR? Was marketing always been your passion? I kind of fell into it, actually. Um, so before this, I worked as a games journalist, mostly freelance across multiple different sites in the UK and the US. Um, and it got to, I was a news editor for a couple of sites. And then um, during the 2008 depression, um, we kind of scraped through that, but then things started tightening up um, a, a couple of years ago, and it was getting to the point where the freelance work was becoming more and more difficult to sustain, um, particularly with a family. So, um, and I'd done marketing and PR in a previous life when I was a lot younger, um, and then I saw really a gap in the market for something that I thought. Um, myself and my co-founder could do a little bit better, a little bit different. Um, and so it was just the perfect opportunity and, and, and circumstances kind of fitted together. And so we set up Vicarious PR um, and, you know, we've been there ever since really. The subject of um, game journalism have something uh, I've been really curious about. The last previous guest, when we talk about the in the Oculus and uh or or how we actually get the word out where the traditional route of journalism was a place where gamers would seek advice for what to play next and you're talking about the collapse of 2008 can you kind of dig into that a bit more about why that happened and uh what led to that sure well i mean i think in terms of when the financial crisis happened i think it hit a lot of traditional sites quite badly simply because it affected the advertising revenue quite strongly and the way that um, many of the traditional gaming press sites were operating was a strictly advertising revenue model um, and this was really before i mean you know you had started to see the rise of influencers um, and YouTubers and, and streamers and but it was still kind of a new thing and a bit of a wild west and what you saw with that crisis was websites either adapted to the new reality of, hey, how do we go about you know, finding new revenue sources and how do we adapt to a more video-focused uh, marketplace, or they didn't. And you know, as advertising revenue shrank and as traffic shrank um, and as ad blocker increased, um, you found that a lot of sites just couldn't keep up with that at all and so they either shrank or you know disappeared completely in some cases um and so you know that's been very much um you're still feeling the effects of that in some cases i mean you know it's very difficult now to to own and operate a, a gaming website um especially with traditional models. Um, so I think, you know, a lot of what IGN and places like that are doing is still trying to figure out um, what new ways and what new content they can do to monetize, to, you know, continue to build revenue uh, and sustain those sites and hopefully grow them. These traditional sites, I think our age group are pretty much used to, I still regularly go to these as a resource for at least AAA gaming, right? Um, in recent years, uh, I'm finally discovering the mobile side of things, the indie side of things, in terms of just where to look for them. Because like anybody, when you're in these commute type of situations, you see people playing these games you never heard of, but everyone seems to be into it. Uh, I'm part of that generation. Um, so with these sites trying to figure its new 
price model or how to a uh, revenue model. Um, what's your general perspective? Like, is that still a valuable asset in terms of maybe the shift has changed for a gamer's perspective, but more uh, and lately, I feel like a game developer perspective of at least these expose or at least like game labors or, or more of those type of stories are that are catching a lot of um, a lot of waves, uh, notoriety. Yeah, uh, respecting it more. I think it. Yeah, I think it depends, right? I mean, you know, a perfect example of of the. Um, differences in how press and how websites can operate is 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 take mobile games for example there's very few successful mobile press sites still around you have touch arcade and you have pocket gamer and a couple of others but you know the once upon a time you know five ten years ago there was hundreds um and the reason that is is because if you look at mobile games specifically mobile users don't look at press websites to get recommendations for the game because why would they because they have the app store and so all they need to do is look at what's trending on app store uh look at social media and you see a dozen mobile game advertisements every time you scroll um and then you would just go into the app store and see what the user reviews are like so there's no need to go view what um, a member of the press thinks about a game because you can just get, uh, you know, a general consensus almost instantly on the app store. Whereas console and PC games, that's a little bit different, right? Because oftentimes you'll have press that, you know, will get access to a PC or console game earlier. And so you're able to kind of feel out um, the game before it comes out. And and the, the cost difference makes a big impact here because it's very easy. You know, the majority of mobile games are free to play, free to download. So it costs you nothing just to try it out for 10 minutes, whereas it costs you $60 to try a AAA game. And so you're obviously going to want to read about that before you make that financial investment into a game. So, you know, audience and what they what they need and what they're looking for um, plays a big role in you know, what type of content to push forward as a site. Um, and then on top of that, with the rise of video, you know, you have to blend the written word and video carefully because, you know, a lot of sites have moved um, to having a lot more video content simply because it's easier to digest for people. And, you know, there is a generational thing in that, in the sense that I think um, younger generations don't want to read um a long form written article anymore they would rather just watch a five minute video where they can actually see the gameplay um and i think there's benefits and downsides to both um but it's interesting to see the shifts within that mm -hmm. and talking about the shifts where it used to be where we look towards these online sites to buy what's next right uh even with the streaming wars that are happening with our favorite streamers the product is more the streamers now, more so what they're playing. And so there's this weird shift, at least for uh, as a game developer myself, where it's hard to kind of peg exactly how do we exactly market that equals to dollars. Like there seems to be multiple paths to take and hoping that sure. exposure itself will somewhat work itself out. But in your perspective, what is the science here where uh, if the let's play and the game journalism are kind of still figuring out the purchasing habits of a customer. Uh, where exactly? Sure. I mean, I think we'd be aiming for. Yeah, I think um, I think you have to, from a game developer perspective, you have to remove the mindset of just short-term thinking in terms of what leads me to um, the biggest conversion rates, right? Because while that is good for like a game launch, it does nothing for you long-term. Now. In terms of conversion rates and like traffic to like say a, st a Steam store page, right? You know, influencers and, and uh, having large influencers, medium sized influencers, and micro influencers play. You, uh, you know, having a lot of those guys play your game on on launch day is going to bring massive traffic and probably massive sales conversion to your site. Whereas having several top tier press websites review your game positively is probably going to give you a bump, but it's probably not going to be anywhere near as comparable to um, having a very large YouTuber play. Um, that said, however, 
there is something there is inherent value in going the traditional media route because a lot of marketers will go well you know say something like brand building is important which a lot of people kind of glaze over their eyes and go i don't know what that means and that just sounds like marketing speech but it comes down to um longevity of a title and longevity of a brand in terms of not only the product's brand but also your developer brand right so having lots of media articles written about you in a positive way may not lead to a sale right there and then but it does lead to recognition in the fact that if you're trying to go from a, you know a small indie team who's making their first game and you're trying to make a, a games company and build and grow that company, you're going to need that brand recognition to have success with the next game, right? So, you know, what will happen is there becomes a a familiarity within the press. And so, you know, if someone like, you know, say your average Joe reads about your first game in GameSpot and Rock Paper Shotgun and PC Gamer, and then, but isn't particularly interested in, um, you know the the type of game that you you presented for your first game you know maybe you made um, a platformer and they don't like platformers so they're not going to buy it right but they can see that it's been reviewed positively however the next game that you bring out is an rpg and that's right up their alley and they know that the first game that you made because they saw it the first time around on all those websites they know that you made a quality, high quality title the first time around. And so actually this is going to be worth me looking into at this point. And so you have to play the game from multiple angles, right? You have to look at your long-term goals and you have to look at your short-term goals when, when really executing any kind of um, outreach strategy, because yes, there are things that you will do that aren't going to pay off, you know, until much later, but that does not, inherently mean that they're not worth doing it just means that you will see dividends later Mm -hmm. Uh, a follow-up question to that Uh, a lot of indie developers are kind of finding the balance when it comes to uh, exposure too early or the right timing overall right Uh, we know developers that since day one uh, they have dead diaries they're building that fan base uh, to eventually have a community built around them uh, until launch is there a method to that madness? Is there a do or don't uh, with that type of thinking? Um, I, I hear both sides of that argument is like, hey, you know, it's great. Yes, a building interest early on. But if your game doesn't come out five years, there's a, such a thing as like tiredness of your brand. <laughs> yeah, I mean, you've, you've got to avoid, you know, fatigue of any type, whether it be community fatigue or media fatigue, it ultimately comes down to, I think, a couple of really important points. What type of game are you making, right? If you're making like a 60-hour in-depth RPG with multiple characters, choice consequences, dialogue trees, everything like that, then you have more to talk about over the long term than you do if you're making a three-hour platformer. Um, Community building is massively important, more so than ever before, I would say, because, you know, with the way that this with Valve and how Steam is changing its algorithm to promote released titles that are performing well, um, it's very difficult to acquire organic in-store traffic. And so really to be successful at at launch now you have to have built a solid community foundation that you know x number of players really enjoy the game these are your core following and they're going to go and buy the game on launch one of the mistakes i see indie developers doing a lot of times is they'll get like these core followers on like a discord to say like they'll get like 200 followers on discord and they'll give them all free keys for supporting the game before it's out And it's like, why would you do that when those are the people who will buy your game? Mm -hmm. You know, you don't need to convince them. They're the people who are already invested. Um, And so really, it's important to push the game in terms of social media and community growing um, as much as possible before launch. I think five years is a bit too extreme. Um, But I think you have to give yourself enough time um, to be able to grow um, a community as much as possible. Now, how long does that actually take? It it, it can vary. I think um, a year or two is fine. I think what's important is being consistent on social media. Um, 
making sure that you're providing a really good experience for the community on places like Discord. So making sure you're interacting with the community, making sure that your social media isn't boring and just, you know, you're not using it as a, as a posting platform, you know, a posting board that we, it's all about you and just announcing, use it as a tool to engage people with instead. Um, and I think, you know, it does, you know, like I say, it doesn't have to be, particularly with social media, it doesn't have to be all about you all the time. Like you can just use it to outreach to people and to talk to people and say, you know, if a film comes out, like a new Marvel movie comes out, ask people what they thought about it. And you don't necessarily have to talk about your game all the time. Um, and that's a really good, and that's something I see people doing a lot of times is like you go on, you know, a Facebook page or a Twitter page and it's almost like reading a notice board. It's like, we're doing this this week, we're doing this this week. And, and, you know, while that is interesting to some degree, um, it doesn't come across as particularly fun or human. Um, and I think that's what you need to really push forward is get people behind you in a human way. Um, and that really pays off. Mm -hmm. Social networking has always been like a, a personal struggle because it, you know, it, it is a full-time gig, uh, for a lot of indie developers that are already stretched out for time. Um, Discord, I feel like, adds another layer to that because this is real-time, 24 hours type of um, fan involvement. Uh, what sure. were your suggestions to, to that side? With Discord being such a prevalent player now with um, games and game marketing, uh, how, how would one best use that platform to keep people engaged I think you just use it. The trick is to not use it like you would like a corporate facing thing. Use it like you would with your friends, right? And talk about things and just engage people and just have fun um, with your community. Um, and I think that's the best way to interact. Just be human and interact on a on a one on one level and don't try and be something that you're not. Um, I think that's super important. Uh, you know, in terms of a full time gig, yes, social media management is is a full time gig, but I think there are ways to get results without it eating your life away. I think the best thing to do is schedule. One of the things that you know I find, uh, particularly in developers, do um, or a habit that they get into is that they'll go, "I don't particularly enjoy doing social media or Discord, and so I'll do it later because I've got." you know, programming or um, design to do. And then I'll just do it later. And then it always gets pushed off later and later until, it, you know, it's six months later and it never gets, it never gets done. The best thing to do is just schedule um, 30 minutes a week to make some social media posts for the week and then plan them out. Um, and then in terms of Discord, just schedule, you know, 10 minutes a day and just be like, okay, you know, 10 minutes in the middle of the day, I'm going to go into the Discord, check up on what the conversations have been, interact with a couple of people and then go. Um, and that way, you know, schedule the time in and it makes the whole thing much more uh, manageable. Mm -hmm. And uh, when it comes to indie developers supporting each other. Right now, I feel like we're still in a lot of our infancy where that seems to be a logical thing for us to do with these small pockets of communities, sharing technology or at least sharing knowledge about development because everyone's pretty much heads down. What's your uh, perspective on that front? Like, do you, do you see any of this really going on? I mean, my hopes are this is happening, but... Uh, I feel like with this such a small team, right? Not anybody's really dedicated to this very important part of our industry. Yeah, I mean, are you talking specifically about stuff like cross promoting and that kind of cross thing? Cross promoting or just opportunities where I feel like when I go to these events, especially, right? I see that everyone seems to know everybody within the community. But uh, it just yeah. doesn't match up to how there isn't enough cross promotion within the games themselves, or at least in promotion <laughs> events. You know, there's nothing really going on with their. Yeah, game. I mean that's that's very much games industry 101, isn't it? I mean, I you know w when we first got into it, it felt very clicky, and it felt like we would go to events and everybody knows everybody except us right um and i think that happens to a lot of developers is that like they turn up um and they feel like everybody's in like these friend groups and they're the only ones not in there um 
and so it does feel like that at times. I think I do see cross promotion happen, and I do see indies helping each other out. I don't think it happens enough. Um, I don't think it happens as much as it should. The difficulty is it's on a case by case basis, and I also think it's on an individual basis because you have to find a game and someone leading a games project that's actually nice um, and and you know doesn't see you as a as a as a business rival or a threat, which they shouldn't really. Um, but people can be funny like that. Um, so it, it just comes down to really. Do the people like each other? And if so, do they like each other enough to cross promote? I mean, for me, I, I wish people would do it more because it doesn't doesn't hurt you in any way. You don't you only gain from it on both sides, ultimately, because you tap somebody else's audience and they tap yours. Um, and you know, you're not gonna lose anybody from that. All you're gonna do is gain. Um, so it makes sense to to you know be to do that more often but yeah i mean I, I i have seen it being done i i haven't i don't see it as much um as much as i would like but i think that's also down to the nature of of games development and, and everyone's heads down and not really focusing on anything else and so it's very it's almost a very internal process um an inward looking process so you, you often find that the reason that people don't cross promote is because they have an outreach to each other so you know, you don't ask if you don't get. What what suggestions, or at least ways that you've seen a, a successful cross promotion work? Is it mostly through social media retweets, or is it something at least uh, during conventions? Oh, how how do you see a successful? Hey, I like this game. You like mine. Let's do something together. Uh, partner. Sure. So I think there's 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 two things that I've seen successful at. I think um, events and social media. Social media is the easiest to do, um, and I think it's always worth doing. Uh, but I've also seen you know a couple of developers who like each other's games group together um to you know go to events because events are very expensive so they you know they chip in and go together and share a booth um so that's one way that i've seen you know that those are a couple of ways i've seen that i think um i would definitely like to see more um creative cross promotion so I, what i would like to see is maybe developers putting in characters from each other's games as a way to cross promote or um adding easter eggs in um, from each other's games to, you know, do that kind of thing. I think that's more fun and inventive. Um, but yeah, I mean, there's lots of ways that it can potentially be done. It's just about finding the right partner. So the, the indie development base have been growing, um, scattered, but not quite together as a unit, but it has been growing. There's uh, more, uh, at least, uh, channels that we can put our games out there it's making it easier for any individual to go out there with an idea to execute and fully go out there and and and, and put it out in the world um vicarious uh pr firms are actually representing indie developers now so it actually seems professional and not just one guy yelling it out the window to his neighbors right uh, i'm seeing a lot sure. of these transformative things happening within this niche industry um, where do you see it being in five years from now with the new generation of consoles being elite, more supportive and actually making it more of their um, public offering when they announce consoles? It's not just about AAA. It's about the indie titles too as well. Um, how do you yeah, I mean... It's, it's a strange one, right? I mean, indies uh, have been fantastic in pushing the industry forward in innovation and, and you know, showing what you can do on very little. Um, the downside has been the sheer amount of indie games that launch because I would say, you know, if you look at Steam as a perfect example, the amount of games that launch on Steam every day is just becoming... Um, ridiculous um, and of those the majority of them are indies and then of those only maybe you know two or three out of 15 or more are actually what i would consider quality indies um and so it's a very competitive marketplace i think the issue that to touch on your point about you know using indies as you know as a way to engage customers um, on platforms um, such as consoles it's a fine line because 
really in terms of large promotional pushes that these companies are going to do or any platform is going to do, it's going to have to be with a game that people like and that's popular. And so inherently, if your game is not doing particularly well, then that offers really no value to you. Um, I think, you know, what's interesting to me is... um, it ultimately comes down to what indies are looking for in terms of what they're creating and um, where they want to go. Because you'll often find, I mean, I use it when I go to, you know, events and speak and stuff, you'll often meet two types of indie developers. You'll meet the indie developers who want to become the games companies, or you'll meet indie developers who are just kind of following their own thing. And they're not really interested in commercial success. They're doing it more as a hobby. Um, and the difference between the two is massive in terms of potential, but it's also massive in terms of game design and where you're going to take it, right? Because if you're just doing it as a hobby, then you can put out anything that you want to put out, even if it's not a particularly um, consumer-friendly game. And you can just sit there and just put it out and no big deal. But I often find that the indie developers who do want to be games companies and they want to do this... Um, long term and they want to make money out of this they have some basic business principles that are missing in their business plans and their game design um, documents that one of the th- mistakes that they make is they mistake the they'll go with their vision um, but not consider what the consumer wants and what you, that is a recipe for commercial disaster because you have to consider what games people want to play when making a game that you want to sell. Um, and I, I feel like as the, as, the, as the industry matures, particularly the industry matures, I think you'll actually find that more and more indie developers who want to go that commercial success route start developing more games that um, have a lot more market research behind them. And so they'll start developing. You'll start to see trends within, like like you see trends within the AAA marketplace where like Battle Royale comes out, sell 6 million copies, then four more Battle Royales come out. I think you'll actually see a lot bigger trends within the indie market as well as that industry begins to mature because they'll try to focus more on making games that sell. Mm-hmm. Also with that crowd, I always... Uh see two types right the types that come from fresh out of college or have always worked in smaller teams and decided to branch off on his own or her own to create that game and uh recently in recent years a lot of triple a guys kind of get into that market with their group of guys and going about Mm -hmm. have you noticed the difference of their style about how to begin this like soul killing journey um coming from such a two different backgrounds i mean you're, you're talking about one being uh going it as a hobby while the other one's going at it as a as a growth platform for a bigger bigger goals like a yeah company or something um well i think it's exactly that right i mean uh, the indies um that come from like the triple a background they will often make games that are com- very commercially viable from the start they'll come in with a plan and say we want to make this rpg but this is what we're going to do with it this is you know these are the reasons why this is going to work this is going to work here's the 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 research and data to back up our decisions on why this game design element is going to work versus this game design element and they'll come into it with a lot more um business sense i would suppose like they've considered every angle um, and they've come at it from a, uh, that standpoint. Whereas the indie developers who've come at it, you know, who are looking to be commercially successful coming straight out of college or with very little um, actual game dev experience, they will focus solely on the development, um, but be blind to all else, including, you know, marketing and everything like that. Is there a percentage that you feel, uh, I guess not a percentage, but the pros and cons of both methodology to approach this very same problem, which is in the end wanting to sell copies. Because uh, <laughs> at least the patterns that I've seen, right? The patterns that I've seen with uh, the business sense AAA guys, they kind of are in it maybe for at least one game, obviously, mm-hmm. and maybe two. 
right? But like in the recent interviews or in everyone I talk to on that side of the fence, it's more about the long tail of things. It's not about, sure. yeah, not the first hit that we get, right? And that's it. Um, so what's what's the mixture of feelings there where you feel one actually does better than the other in terms of just longevity as a group? Yeah, well, I mean, the, the companies that have got a long-term plan will always be successful long-term. They'll, they'll always have inherently more longevity, regardless of if they have one hit or they have, you know, four games that sell reasonably well that turn a profit. Um, the, you know, the people who are forward thinking will always have more longevity than the than the developer who is just going game by game and hoping for the best. Um because planning is everything, right? And I think one of the reasons why, you know, these commercially uh, successful indies do so well, is particularly the ones that come from like that AAA or um, well-experienced backgrounds, is that they, they, know the, they know the importance of everything that goes with game development, not just... Because one of the biggest mistakes that indies make is they'll go in and go, okay, well, I'm going to blow $300,000 on a game, and then they'll finish the game, and then they'll come to like a PR agency and they go, okay, I need to, you know, it's two months away from launch. I need to market my game and I've got no money to do it. And agencies like us will kind of look at them going, well, I don't know what you expect us to do. Like you're, you're a month away from launch. What, what you're not giving me anything to work with here because they're so, um, inward focused on making the game that they want to make. And oftentimes, you know, they can even freak a creep to add things to the game that didn't need to be added in. Um, and they can't, you know, they, they need to have a, an outside perspective on, on the game design document to avoid that kind of thing. But they don't plan to actually sell games. And I think that's the biggest importance, right? Like how can you, you can't build a business without customers and sales. Um, and operating under the idea that if I build something good, they will come is foolish, especially in today's market, because, you know, what, why would people choose your game that they can't, you know, they've, you, you, you've inherently got no visibility anymore. Anyway, there's 25 other games or more releasing every single day. So there's massive competition and games are relatively cheaper than they've ever been. Uh, there's more of them than there ever been. So why would they go to your game when they could choose a dozen others in the same genre, get them cheaper um, and have a similar experience. Um, and so that's why I think um, developers who come in with a very business focused mindset um, have a lot more longevity because they they understand the importance of getting visibility, uh, making sure that they have a good community, making sure that there's marketing and PR behind them to actually promote the game um, and ultimately get sales. What's the window of time that you recommend for developers out there to get in touch with a PR firm such as yourself um, during their development? Um. I think you should do the initial consultation about a year away, um, about a year away from launch. Um, I think it's always worth having, I, I would say, ask for advice before you, when you start a game, um, ask for advice on like features. Like, cause it, one of the things I see more and more is like people come to me and they'll go, I made this really cool narrative driven um, single player game. And by the end, and then, you know, they'll say to me something like off the hand, they'll go, oh, oh and we're go also going to add in um, one-on-one local co-op or, or local one, local one-on-one -on -one PVP. And I'm like, why, why, why would you do that? Like it's a single player narrative driven game. Why, what's the, what's the need to add a pointless multiplayer mode that no one is going to play and that just costs you money. Um, so I think, you know, having someone to give you that type of advice is super helpful in terms of like specifically marketing and PR. Um, I would say have the initial consult maybe a year away from launch to start talking about budgets and plans and, you know, where you want to take it and um, that kind of thing. I think, you know, the average, a really good campaign in terms of a really good PR and marketing campaign will, will, will run anywhere from like six months to a year. Um, but it very much depends on, you know, budget and stuff like that. Well, we got the, at least time. What is the at most time? Because I, 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 
I, I feel like in the brainstorming session, and this is where developers, I feel a lot of creatives lack the business senses where they don't really look at the market, the timing of things, other entertainment mm -hmm. mediums of when the rough release date is so that when they coincide with that, it actually makes sense. Like the general public is prepared for a game like such as yours, whatever genre right. it is. And I feel like someone like a, like you yourself or a PR firm has a firmer idea of market of the market to actually help develop an idea that makes sense two years from now. Um, when is it too early to actually approach with a rough like one line or one page summary to can, kind of get the consultations like, hey, I'm thinking like this. You guys know the market better than I do. Is this something viable two years from now, according to your background? Sure. I mean, it's, I don't think it's ever too early for that that initial like that initial piece of advice. I don't think it's ever too early for that. That I think um, that's not to say that you know just because you get some advice you should take it because you know advice is free for a reason sometimes. Um, yeah. But I think that you know it's worth getting. It's worth educating yourself about the market. It's worth educating yourself about what other people think about it. Um, and so, you know, having it straight away before you even get into the nitty gritty of the game is is, is always worth having that initial conversation because, you know, you maybe develop. You know, because there's so many indies that like get developed, and it's like, why did you make this now? Like that that whole trend is over. Like they come at it like a year or two late, um, because they started on the tail end of it. And I think you know if you have that conversation very very early on, um, before you've really built out your game, it gives you the time if needed to. Um, if you look at the market and say there is no, there's not going to be a market for this in two years, it gives you the time to pivot um, before you've you've got yourself knee deep and tens of thousands of dollars in, into it. Mm -hmm. And this kind of leads me to another question, like um, maybe a few years ago, and I hear this a lot with um, with friends or, or at least on the other side of the table who are part of like investment firms. We're looking at games and, you know, we're, we're dear friends with Steve Gaynor. I, I worked with them a long time ago and Gone Home was one of those things that indie teams would pitch as uh like this is like gone home but for this and most of it is because it's a it's a viable product for a small team to make it's a two three hour experience of compelling uh storytelling but as of late those type of games are like you said those that that trend is gone like people mm -hmm. want to invest in a community not into a two-hour game uh that costs twenty dollars and it's just mm -hmm. not uh, un, un, unless you're like really groundbreaking in some way where you're like no man well, no man's guy is not a two-hour game but something that is so compelling that you have to play like the witness or something right those games are just not viable for the market anymore um in your experience like these people who have a dream of telling a story as straightforward as a single narrative <laughs> gameplay is there a place for them anymore or, or are you uh, is there a way that they can adapt it with the market trends to make it viable again? Because there's they're still a really good place. Like I myself and still enjoy those type of games. But like you said, yeah. it's just a different audience um, that might not be. Yeah, no, I, I mean, I think there's still an audience and I think I think there's still an audience. I think those games can still sell well. Right. The, the biggest issue is not. Is there an audience? I think you can always find an audience. It's especially with narrative games that are short and very concise. Um, the biggest issue is presentation and execution. And the, and the, 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 the brutally honest fact is that the majority of developers who try these type of games do not get either of those two right. Um, and so if you don't get, you know, if you're making like a three hour game that is very narrative focused and you don't get the presentation and execution right, that is the fundamental thing of what is going to be interesting to people. Um, and so you've got like one of the core pillars of the game instantly wrong. And, and, you know, it, it's one of those things that is, a, it's very difficult to gauge from, I suppose, from a game developer perspective, because you're coming in it going, I want to do this. I think this is a good idea. But one of the things that I think de developers don't ask themselves enough is why do I think this is a good idea? And I think that's the big, that's the big problem. Like they they go, I I like this, so I'm going to do this. Versus, 
why do I like, why do I think this is going to, why do I think people are going to like this? What, what evidence, what, you know, what, what ideas, what thoughts are behind this? Um, where's the proof of people are going to like this art style that I like? Um, and if, if your answer is, well, someone else did it, then that's not a good answer. Um, one of the things that I, I always tell indie developers when they come to me very early on is don't look at another indie success and try and replicate that because that's not a path to success because you can't, if, if, if it was as easy as looking at what someone else did and then replicating that, everybody would be successful and I would be out of a job. Um, it's about, I would suggest looking and studying failures and seeing why other games failed. That provides much more valuable insight into, into what to do and how to go forward than something like looking at Gone Home and going, oh, that was successful. Why was it successful? Because you're never going to replicate those things. Um, and so that's the best way to approach it is to, is to really think through how you're going to, to execute. Kind of writing off that, um, a lot of indie developers who approach you, like what, 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 what are the common mistakes that you keep seeing with new teams coming, coming at your firm or other firms like, uh, sure. With a set of problems. Um, I think common mistakes are one, they don't budget anything for marketing and PR. They come in and they'll go to me, oh, can you take a percentage of my revenue? No, I don't want to do that. Um, like you're asking me to work for free. Would would you would you be okay if I asked you to work for free? Like it's a, it's a very strange thing that kind of only happens to PR and marketing people sometimes. Um, I know it happens to developers well, but like oh, developers can work for us for rev share and stuff like that. It's it's a weird thing. But like especially when what makes me laugh is like when you get those those projects where that you know like they they literally just tell you that they spent like half a million dollars of their own money on um, development, but like want you to work on 5% revenue. Very strange thing. Um, so that's one mistake is that they don't like a lot of indies really don't budget um, enough for PR and marketing um, because you need to have a really good marketing budget to be able to get the visibility you need um, to be able to get sales. Um, Another big mistake that I find what they do is they'll feature creep quite heavily. So they'll add things into the game that do not need to be added in that don't add anything to the core experience um, and have only just cost time and money. Um, they Another big mistake is they don't um, post regularly and put any time and effort into social media efforts. Um, another is um, that they have come into development operating on assumptions. Um, and a lot of which tend to be either wrong or um, looked at in the incorrect way. So they'll, you know, they'll they'll come in and go, okay, well, we've got a battle royale game, um, and there's battle royales popular, um, without really thinking through some key elements outside of that. Um, so I say those are, those are probably um, the biggest ones um, in terms of like when developers come to pitch me for for the publishing side um the biggest mistake i see in pitches is that they'll show me the game or like a prototype or a vertical slice and you know just let, let's say someone's making a turn-based rpg um, and they'll show me like the turn-based combat but the unique selling point of the game is like the changing environments within combat so like environmental kills and stuff like that they won't show me that and what I want to see uh, as a publisher, you know, is that you can execute on the thing that's most difficult about the game. Um, and if you can't show me that, because it's really easy to, you know, have someone walk down a hallway. Um, anybody can program that in Unity, but show me that you can do the difficult thing of your pitch. And, and that gives you a lot more um, credibility. That's why I feel like a lot of developers kind of, uh misplan right I, I feel like having someone on the marketing side at the very beginning of the game can help a lot of indie developers from uh crashing and burning <laughs> and uh i i feel like um yeah every team 
probably is a little different, but what would you say is like a percentage would you think if you were to sit down with teams like, hey, you should probably put this aside for marketing. If I were to ask for from an investor, like 20%, 50%, like how much of a percentage from small to big, like would you suggest sure. developers out there I, think I, about this I, and put this aside? I would say about half. Mm-hmm. Whatever you're going to spend on, like, say, so if you spend five hundred thousand dollars on a game, you need half that for your marketing budget. I think you need a minimum. I think you need a minimum of around fifty to eighty thousand um, dollars. But I think, and that's not always the case. Like some games, you can get away with smaller budget. I'm not saying that you can't get away with a small budget sometimes. Uh, but I think on average, I think you should be putting half of what you spend on game development towards marketing and PR. And when it comes to terms of, um, this is something that I've been trying to look for, but we haven't really found, is that um, the traditional way of putting your product out there until it's done, right? So there's there are ways that I see a lot of games playing around with like crowdfunding as the game is going on mm-hmm. and stuff like that. Just you know, is this a viable product from beginning to end? Will people pay for it from day one versus day, you know, 700 after two years? Uh, have sure. you seen any fun way that developers are kind of changing how we pay for a product um, that that fits along with this changing landscape of indie development? No, I mean, I think... There's two ways to go about it, right? You go, you go the, the free-to-play model or the traditional model. Um, in terms of trying to, I mean, what I see more and more is developers using crowdfunding as a, a, a as a proof of concept almost. Um, a lot of the time, so they'll 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 raise like ten, fifteen thousand um, dollars for the sake of trying to prove that the game is uh, commercially viable. Um, I don't think there's really any massive innovations in terms of business models. Um, I think it'll be interesting in the next like five to 10 years as more and more streaming models come along where like almost like Xbox game pass where um, you get more and more companies trying to be the Netflix of games. Um, I think there are inherent problems with that on the technical side, but um, it will be interesting to see how that business model works. I think on the PC side of things, there's there's not much you can do to really innovate in that in that business model type of way. I think all you can try and do is price the game at a level that you think is fair um, and that appeals to to customers and um, to pull the trigger point rather than just add it to a wish list and wait for a really deep sale. Um, I think you've got to try and find that that balance. You touched on this point that I've been kind of curious about. Um, this, the streaming side of things, I, I do agree with you. There's a lot of technical stuff, uh, at least in the States, that we have um, we have market caps, <laughs> which kind of refrains us from streaming all the games that we want. I mean, that alone is a problem. Um, but like the business side of things is something very curious. Like I, My best hopes with it is that the console makers or whoever – there's providing the service is going to pay the fair share for indie developers to thrive because, you know, it is very nice to kind of open up a Netflix type of menu and be exposed to games that I wouldn't normally consider, right? That's what's happening at least with the movie model. And that is something I hope that would transfer the games. But I feel like um, it's a different medium. Uh, You're not investing just with certain hours of the time. You're investing days and even weeks and months to finish a game. Um, to its full satisfaction. I wonder what your general thoughts about, are, are you kind of waiting and seeing? Are you hopeful or are you just, uh, are, are you thinking that this is something that won't give too much of a boost uh, for indie developers out there? I think it's an interesting concept, right? I, I, I'm not convinced on the technical aspects yet, I think, because it's very easy to stream a, a movie because you're just watching it. Whereas an interactive uh, form of entertainment is much more difficult to do over the internet um, without operating on a local machine. Um, and I think there's so many technical issues right now with like, things like Google Stadia that 
I don't think it's viable yet as a as a mainstream solution. Um, I think it's um, I think it's an interesting concept that will find a market if those technical issues get solved. Um, I think on the business model side, I think it's you know it'll be interesting to see how that works, right? Like, are they going to pay, like say they're going to put your game on the, on the service for six months, they're going to give you X amount of money. Like it, it, it's, it's a potential decent revenue source, particularly for indies. Um, but the question is on the, those, ser- those services are going to be heavily curated. Um, so are indies outside of the most popular indies going to even get a look in on that service? Because, though you know, it's not going to be like Steam. It's going to be um, a hand-picked service where the games are all curated very carefully um, because they're going to be paying for them up front, right? So um, it'll be interesting to see how many, how open that is to indie developers. Um, but I'm not convinced on the on the uh, on the technical side of it yet. Um, but I think if you did get the if you did get the technical solved, I think. Um, what it one thing I don't think it will be is it's not a replacement for the way that consumers play games now. Like I don't think a streaming service with a large library of games is going to replace Steam. I don't think it's going to replace the Xbox. I don't think it's going to replace the the PS4 um, because gamers inherently like ownership of their titles and they like creating their library of games. Um, and with streaming services, you're never going to be able to do that because all you need to do is cancel your subscription and you ne- never have access to your games again. Um, so I think it's going to be the mar- it's going to, there's going to be a market for it. I just don't think it's going to be um, inherently revolutionary as people think it's going to be. I think I agree with you. I, I am also in the wait and see. Uh, we're about a year away from that, all that happening anyway. So, But speaking of which, we have finished an hour of podcasting. And uh, I want to congratulate you on that for uh, sticking with <laughs> us for the last hour. Uh, this is also the time where I hand the mic over to you so that you can give attention to, shout out, or uh, promote anything that you wish to promote. So the mic is yours. Sure. Um. So yeah, I mean, game developers, if you're interested in getting a consult on PR marketing, you can head up Vicarious PR. Um, and also we just announced our debut title uh, for Vicarious Publishing, which is a game called My Beautiful People Smile. So um, you can go check that out on Steam. All right. Thank you, Michael. Uh, it was a no great conversation. It's always great to kind of talk to people on that side about actually selling products. Uh, <laughs> it seems to be a very important part, and I agree with you. Uh, you, you would think so, right? <laughs> yeah. 50-50 sounds very fair and very important. And so uh, thank you so much, Mike. And uh, that concludes today's episode. See you guys next week. Bye. Bye.